Hello and welcome to this video which is part four of my history of jazz. Now in part three we got to the point where in the 1940s Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie had created bebop and that was the the, the big move forward in jazz you know that uh, Charlie Parker um, was a, a sound and phrase and melody innovator. The, the way that he played actually changes the way that everybody played. The bebop had a new way of phrasing, a uh, new way of approaching rhythm and a new way of pro approaching harmony which revolutionizes jazz. But let's just back up here because I feel like we're missing something here, right? So if we back up back to 1930s, we're now back in the swing era with the big bands. Now these are incredibly popular groups. They're selling millions of records. The kids love swing bands. But within the swing band, that encompasses popular music, right? So there's vocals, there's songs. You know, there's singers like uh, Bing Crosby and later on Frank Sinatra that are really going to, you know, create popular music singing in a way. Uh, well, especially the way it's going to be in the second half of the 20th century. But also within the swing bands, we have a, a, a high degree of virtuosity and sophistication. And the kids love this. You know, people who are virtuoso musicians like Artie Shaw and Benny Goodman, Gene Krupa, have become superstars, film stars. So at that point, um, the highest music in jazz, the, the most complex music and the most popular is all contained within the big bands, the swing bands. Um, there are small groups, but these small groups are still operating like very um, shrunk down uh, uh, big bands. Now, one thing I must admit, or uh, that I realized I'd missed out on my little history, was that in the 1930s, one of these smaller swing bands uh, called the Hot Club of France, the Hot Club de France in France, which features two incredible musicians, uh, Stephen Grappelli on violin and Django Reinhardt on guitar, they really are the first international non-American jazz musicians. So in the 30s, we see jazz opening out all over the world. Every single country has their own jazz musicians. Here in the UK, we have our, you know, Stan Tracy's and uh, Toby Hayes and Ronnie Scott's uh, and Joe Harriet's, you know, um, we, we have our own jazz history which I'm going to talk about at some point um, so jazz also goes out but people like Django um, are the first international uh, jazz superstars so we see jazz opening out and we see jazz you know becoming the dominant form now by the time we get to the 1940s with bebop bebop is an esoteric narrow um, limited form popular music wise so jazz has really changed and i thought after the last video i didn't really uh, cover that so i'm going to cover that uh, on this one um so what happens is the big bands are almost undone by their success okay um in the 1930s you a uh, standard big band may feature a singer so the song would open up and you'd have some solos, maybe the main guy would take a solo or the, the lead solo would take a solo. And then after a chorus or so, um, the singer would kick in. At some point that stops. And it's really with the advent of Frank Sinatra where this, the focus goes away from the big band. It's still big band music, but it goes away from the big band to the singer. The singers now start to become the stars. You know, if you look at uh, Chick Webb's band, which features Ella Fitzgerald, Ella Fitzgerald is the singer for Chick Webb's band. Then when Chick Webb dies in 1939, she takes over the band and then she becomes the, 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 the pop star. And Ella Fitzgerald, yeah, she may be one of the greatest singers that's ever lived. And she, it, it, is, it is high art. This is the thing that we get from the swing bands. It's high art, but it's also popular music. And um, Ella Fitzgerald is going to go on to sell millions and millions of records, unlike Charlie Parker. You know, there's not. So one of the things that undoes the big big bands is the fact that the popular singers from those big bands sort of take over and the focus goes on to them. Also, the Second World War starts up and um, a lot of the musicians uh, get drafted because they're of that age into the army. You know, Glenn Miller famously, you know, manages to keep his band together because he forms an army band with all these musicians that are in the army out there, you know, with him. You know, until he uh, most likely, you know, crashes over the English Channel in his plane, you know, in 1944. Although we don't really know what happened to Glenn Miller. 
Um, so that's the second thing, you know, the Second World Cup war came and sort of undoes the big bands. But also there was, a, there was a strike amongst the musicians in America and they weren't able to record. You know, um, and the, the effect that ha that had is, is quite interesting because not only does it undo the big bands, you know, people have to survive on live concerts. Um, so the smaller bands become more successful. Within the smaller bands, a whole host of musicians are really pushing the swing band formula forward, which becomes bebop. By the time that band's out, stops around about 1944, 1945, bebop is, is, is created. So suddenly, Charlie Parker and people like that start to make records and people start to hear these. The jazz musicians start to hear them. And of course, Charlie Parker's mind blown. I think there's a lot of positivity about um, Charlie Parker. Don't, don't get me wrong. This is one of the, you know, I would say him and, uh, and Louis Armstrong are the two great, great soloists. When you hear Louis play, that's his way of playing. Everybody in the 1920s, 30s is trying to be like Louis. It's, it's an advancement on Louis, but they're trying to be, be like Louis. But Charlie Parker comes around playing in a different way, you know, which I've covered in the, the, uh, the last video. Um, and then everybody wants to play like Charlie Parker. And, and to this day, if you're a jazz musician, you want to say, I'm a jazz musician, you're going to have to pay your dues. I think this is, this is not a great thing for jazz. But you have to pay your dues, which means you have to be able to play like a bebop jazz musician. Not a modal jazz musician, not a free jazz musician, not a jazz fusion jazz musician, or even a swing band jazz musician. You're going to have to be able to play like a bebop right and that's whole held over it's become the thing if you go to jazz college you know all these um thousands of kids coming out of music college now right what they've been able to do is be able to play through the changes right it's completely in this day and age irrelevant as a skill right all the jazz musicians that they're going to get horrified but this video is going to get worse because i really think um the negative side of Charlie Parker is the fact that musicians really wanted to copy him. You know, so Charlie Parker was a heroin addict. So, so musicians uh, went towards that way of life thinking that that was the secret to play like Charlie Parker. There's something that happens with bebop. Bebop um, creates a way of living, a, a sort of a myth, a story, the whole... Um, idea of what a jazz musician is and it's not necessarily a positive one but also bebop is really uncommercial we see um jazz be stopping being the popular commercial um powerhouse music form of the 20th century and it now becomes esoteric normal people don't like it they don't get it it just sounds like noise it just sounds like people making stuff up and they don't understand it that starts with bebop and that's gone all the way through jazz you know anybody who loves jazz knows that there's no audience for it you know as frank zappa said it was unemployment music um so uh that starts with bebop as well but i think the worst thing is in terms of the jazz history books is the idea that jazz in the 30s, the swing bands then become bebop, and that's the next phase in the history of jazz, because of course it's not. You know, those singers like Frank Sinatra that create this vocal style of jazz, right, uh, that's going to move in, become the next popular music. So there's jazz splits. Jazz was popular music, and now it splits into an esoteric form, which is no longer popular music, and it moves through, okay? Also, a lot of the big bands that pared down, you know, um, they become rhythm and blues bands. You know, people like Louis Jordan, um, who really is taking one of the great um, innovations of uh, swing jazz and taking the rhythm section, drums, piano, bass, you know, playing rhythm and blues, which is jazz swing mixed with blues formula. That is one of the most important innovations jazz ever did. So if you take that innovation, that carries on through the 1940s, those sort of jump, you know, jump rhythm and blues bands that exist, right, carry on. A lot of musicians come through that. You know, it, it goes right over to the blues, people like Tebow Walker, you know, and Sister Rosetta Tharp. That they're right on the cusp between jazz and blues, right? And and those artists then start to bring country influences in and that becomes rock and roll. So when you listen to Rock Around the Clock, uh, you know, by Bill Haley and the Comets, what you're hearing there is a jump 
jazz, rhythm and blues band with a country influence. So rock and roll, I would see, is an equal, um, you know, son or daughter of jazz, swing jazz, right? Um, so it's interesting, when, when you um, listen to um, Chuck Berry play Johnny Be Good, and he comes in and he goes, well, that's like an Elmore James lick. That's where he's got that from. So he comes in and he goes, now that there is a bebop line. That's come from Charlie Christian. I think I mentioned this in the last video. So we can see that um, rock and roll has got a great big dollop of jazz in, right? And it's as removed from the swing bands as perhaps bebop is. We could see, obviously, that people like Frank Sinatra, you know, and the popular singers that come in after him, like Tony Bennett, you know, like Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, these are all popular singers, they sell records, but they also come straight out of jazz, that, you know. So there's, these, there's more than just bebop coming out of the 1940s. And I would say the big styles that come out of jazz in the 1930s, early 50s, would be soul, people like Ray Charles. I mean, look at Ray Charles, right? Ray Charles starts off, as a Nat King Cole styled, you know, piano trio artist. But he's also got his feet in the church. He's, he's listening to church music. And as soon as he takes that church music and puts a rhythm and blues spin on it, he invents soul. You know, soul's gonna become funk, funk's gonna become disco, disco's gonna become dance music, it's gonna become hip hop, it's gonna become rap, it's gonna become house, it's gonna become, you know, which is gonna become jungle and drum and bass. Right, jazz has always been one of the foundations of popular music in the 20th century. And bebop is as well. But bebop is suddenly this esoteric form, okay? Um, it's a, I've always thought that be bebop's a bit like punk. It does for rock and pop music what, um, sorry, um, punk did for rock and pop music what bebop does for jazz in the 1940s, you know. It basically is the next generation's music. And it, and it really sort of sticks its fingers up to the old guys and says, we're no longer, we're not about you, we're moving forward into the future. It's, this is making jazz for our generation. But that, those styles of music cannot last um, very long, all right? Um, punk didn't, punk, actual punk is a couple of years. Bebop's the same. And then the bebop musicians, they start to think, well, what do we do next? And what I think, which I don't think anyone ever says, is they all went, how do we now make this music commercial again? We have lost our footing. Look at the rock and roll guys, you know, look at the, you know, look at Earl Bostick. Charlie Parker, you know, when you watch um, the Bird film, he goes down to see, I think it's Earl Bostick, which is a sort of honking rhythm and blues saxophone player. And he sees him wearing the crowds and he realizes you know, that he doesn't do that. That's not what he's about. He makes esoteric music. So Charlie Parker thinks, what can I do? And he basically tries to be like Frank Sinatra. He brings in strings, right? The, the, the last great recordings of Charlie Parker are a lot more mellow. You know, what does um, Dizzy Gillespie do? He brings in, you know, um, Afro-Cuban, Latin American influences. This is one of Dizzy's great um, innovations in jazz is to bring those influences in. You know, and Afro-Cuban music really is going to influence dance music, you know. Uh, so, um, and he, that, again, I think is an attempt to be more commercial. Dizzy actually also uh, tries to set up a big band again. You know, he uses singers. Um, Miles Davis, I think, is one of the musicians that solves it the best with his Birth of the Cool album, which I think is around about 19, or oh, was it, is it 1948, 1946, 47, somewhere around there where he tries to calm bebop down. He tries to make it more lyrical. He goes back to the more expanded sound of the big bands, but using Gil Evans' arrangements, you know, he does that in a way which is um, an advancement on what the big bands do. It's more orchestral. He's po pointing to what became third stream music. You know, this is a, a style of music that came out after bebop, which doesn't get the mention. You know why? Because a lot of those musicians are white musicians that created it. I'm thinking like Stan Kenton, Lenny Tristano, Juan Marsh, Lee Konitz. You know, they come out with a cooler style of music, which is much more reliant on classical music forms, expanded forms. That, that third stream, that you could call it progressive jazz. You know, Stan Kenton's the king of it. That music is like 
um, jazz's progressive rock. Okay, and that influence is going to be uh, important. And, that, and then Stan Kenton was a really successful artist. Um, and so the 1950s, you see ex bebop musicians trying to claw back some commercial uh, commerciality in different ways. They're all trying to do it in different ways. Um, for me, the musician that is most successful at this is Miles Davis. And what Miles Davis does is he basically is like a Frank Sinatra. He's got this voice which is lonely and sad. And when he plays popular songs of the day, so he can take a Disney song like Someday My Prince Will Come, but when he plays it, he transforms it into something which is quite sublime and moving and sad. And this makes him very, very popular. Miles Davis was there able to change the face of music over and over again you know, to be so important in the development of fusion, which of course you know my videos, this, this history is moving towards. Um, you know, he was able to do that because in the 1950s he became a very successful artist with a major label deal. And the reason he could do that was because of his sound and the way he could transform popular music songs, which is what jazz musicians had done from the beginning of time. Time after time they did it. And I mention that because, of course, even right up to the 1980s, Miles Davis was still a mainstream artist because he was able to cover a tune like Cindy Lauper's time after time, you know. And with this, his sound, this is one of the great innovations of jazz, with his personal sound, transform it into something else. So this video really wanted to look at the way jazz fractures, this idea of jazz becoming an esoteric form. You know, and then that form trying to fi find ways back to commerciality to, at varying degrees of success. But also look at the other music forms that have now spun out of jazz in the 1940s, really creating the dominant popular music forms of the late 20th century, i.e. rock and roll, soul, you know, rhythm and blues, um, rock music, you know. And the greatest... Um, you know, descendant of jazz is rock music. Now, of course, rock music is, is really comes out of the blues, you know, and as we've said before, the blues holds hands with uh, jazz. But that's in terms of the song structure and the song um, subject matter. But in terms of instrumentation, you know, rock music comes out of jazz. And I think that's what I'm going to be talking about on the next video, which is um, the instrumentation of jazz, you know. But where are we at now? We're up to the 1950s. So we were, we've got Miles Davis. We've got that cooler jazz style. Uh, Bebop's also, it, it's, it's, it's heavied itself up with the blues. A little bit, a bit more rhythm and blues and a little, you know, and that's hard bop. People like Art Blakey, we've got those styles of music. We have um, uh, within jazz two styles, you know, Miles Davis is cool, but he's, it, it's, it's um, a New York, you know, East Coast style uh, with more black musicians involved. On the other side of America, you've got um, West Coast jazz with more white musicians involved. That'd be like Jerry Mulligan, you know, um, Dave Brubeck. And that music's more successful. All these styles are successful. You know, jazz starts to become successful in the college circuit. It becomes the audience where there is success is less of a black audience. The black black audience in America listen to different music. Then they're not listening to Dave Brubeck or maybe even Miles Davis. I'm sure some of them are. But it's all about fracturing. We've got lots of different styles going on. It's it's difficult to track them all. And I think that most jazz histories tend to favour one or the other. You know, and I think um, as I've been mentioning, you know, black arts and white arts. I think the reason is which I don't like to do. I think jazz is, um, is an incredible form of music, form of art created by Afro-American musicians. But the great gift is that anyone can play it. Let's go back to the beginning of the video and look at Django Reinhardt. Django Reinhardt is one of the top 10 most important jazz musicians in history. And he's a French gypsy. Anyone can play this form. Right. Um, we tend to look at jazz history now with revisionist eyes. We look through it with the spectacles of identity politics. But jazz is an open form. It's going to play a part in the civil rights movement in the 1960s because it's inclusive. You know, it, it, it's inclusive of everybody. 
And that's the very thing that uh, Afro-Americans are asking for in the 1960s, is to be able to be included, to be a part of it. Yes, there are the separatists. But I think jazz has never, ever been a separatist art form. It's what makes it absolutely great. These are the important things. This is where jazz is still relevant, you know, um, in the 1950s and 60s. But anyway, I'm going to end the video there. That's my little roundup of, um, I think I'm going to call it to be or to bop. That's what I will call this video, I think. And I hope uh, it makes sense. I've tried to tie some things up. In the next video, I'll be looking at the instrumentation of jazz and how that influences um, popular music forms. Thank you very much.